Now I'm going to talk about Charles Darwin um, and the Voyage of the Beagle. You've probably heard of Charles Darwin. You've probably heard of the Voyage of the Beagle. And you probably know, and you would be right in knowing, that the Voyage of the Beagle was absolutely instrumental in the development of Darwin's thinking and indeed in the development of uh, his ideas on evolution by natural selection. Um, what you probably don't know, I mean, this is a what-if exercise. There was an almost what-if sort of experiment done um, Shea Darwin, actually, at his father's home before he went on the Voyage of the Beagle. He was um, invited sort of through an old boy network. They were, Captain Fitzroy, the captain of the Beagle, wanted an assistant, somebody of the right social rank, somebody who knew some natural history. He, asked, uh, he put his networks out, um, asked a number of people, including um, a man called Henslow, a botanist at Cambridge, who at that stage had a wife and several small children. He leapt at the opportunity. Yes! I mean, just this is, think about it. This is pre-global travel, the chance to actually go around the world and see the world. Then he went home to his wife um, <laughs> and, a many, and the many sort of mewling children. So that got nixed. Um, and, he, and he passed it on to his undergraduate protege, who was this guy, Charles Darwin, who, who was literally just finishing his undergraduate career. Um, he's about to become a nice Church of England vicar, now, which is the right thing for most people to do. Um, Charles, <laughs> Charles Darwin um, was a good naturalist. He had a, a, a almost problematic fixation on beetles. Um, he was learning some geology. Um, but why not invite him? He was right social rank. He would work with, with um, Fitzroy. Fitzroy, by the way, was a phrenologist, the captain of the Beagle. He had to check out Darwin. This is somebody he's going to spend five years in very close proximity with. Um, he was a phrenologist. He was very unimpressed by the, the pitch of Darwin's nose, um, <laughs> which apparently worked out okay in the end. Anyway, this, is, this wasn't an official naval position. This was as a guest, essentially, on a naval expedition, which meant that Dad, Charles's father, Robert, would have to pay for it. And <laughs> imagine, I'm going away for five years, Dad. Do you mind footing the bill? Now, <laughs> Dad has a number of objections. You're about to become a vicar. Hello, what's this got to do with that? Right? But the nicest objection was this. Look, if it's already sort of percolated its way down to you as a sort of snotty face just graduated undergraduate, it must have been turned down by lots of other people, right? Okay, which means there must be serious problems with this whole enterprise, right? So, no, you shouldn't go. Um, he was rescued by his uncle. Charles was rescued by his uncle who intervened on his behalf, and off he goes on, and it's nearly five years, the voyage of the Beagle. Um, and we have this sort of romantic notion of Darwin City standing there, splashed by the sea spray. No, he wasn't. He was pathetically seasick the whole time. He was miserable. As a five-year voyage, he only spent 18 months at sea, um, which uh, is as much time as he could do on land, where he was uh, rather more comfortable. And we all know he went to the he went to the Galapagos. And there it is. I mean, that's really what the voyage was about, right? Going to the Galapagos to see all those little finches with their different shaped bills. Uh, no. Um, the voyage was actually about mapping Terra del Fuego. The Galapagos was kind of secondary, sort of on the way home, long way home. Um, five weeks only at the Galapagos. And Darwin, yes, he collects finches. Darwin is a trainee vicar, remember, in the Church of England. He's looking around the Galapagos. They're pretty dismal sort of volcanic lumps in the Pacific on the, on the equator. They're all the same, right? One island? Looks pretty much like any other island. Why is God going to go to any trouble to put different things on different islands? Same place, different islands, okay? So he commits the biggest single fallacy a scientist can commit. When you went out, you were four, you were in pre-K, and you went on your first nature expedition to a muddy pond be behind your daycare with Mrs. Burgess, okay? <laughs> and you had a little jam jar, okay? which you put down beside you and you fished around and you got muddy and then fell in and Sally nearly drowned. It was all quite dramatic. Um, and you're, you're pulling, sorry? How do you know this about I'm oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> you're getting too close to Yeah, home. sorry, yes. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> let's be more general. Well, but in, your, <laughs> but, but, but in your case, Sally actually drowned. Um, um, now, what Mrs. Burgess told you, right, this sample of these tadpoles you're taking um, is meaningless without data. You've got a right that it was taken here, you know, rest in peace, Sally, um, on such and such a date and so on. You take data. Record. Darwin failed. 
to do that. He didn't label which islands his specimens came from. Loser. Okay? <laughs> Okay, so it wasn't, and, and this is, and it's actually kind of sad. There's this notion that Darwin had his eureka moment. You know, he's almost, you can see the, the prow of the beagle creaming through the surf, the young Darwin leaping off, the birds twittering, and then there's a whole little Archimedes thing. Um, no, it wasn't until he got home, six months after he got home, he'd sent his bird specimens to an expert, Mr. Birds, a man called John Gould in London. And it was John Gould. And there's Darwin looking all confused and foolish. John Gould, the older man, the expert, who sort of said, no, actually, what you've got is really interesting. And these funny little brown and gray jobs with different sized bills, they're not a whole bunch of very disparate bird groups as you suppose them to be. They're actually one single group, finches. And isn't that curious, okay? That, if you want a eureka moment, that was the penny dropping to a certain extent for Charles Darwin. That, to a certain extent, was indeed the seed that would eventually turn into the great theory that was published in 1859. Now, so, what if? What There's if it, no evolution then, if Darwin's not on the beagle. Interesting, yes. Well, it would be like living in certain parts of the United States, wouldn't it? Um, Need I point out, uh, Ru he's from Kentucky and I'm from Missouri, so be careful oh, what you're saying. <laughs> just be careful, just be careful. Ambush. <laughs> um, no, there would have been a theory of evolution, and a, and a somewhat similar, the, the, the main components of that theory of evolution would be very familiar to Charles Darwin. Darwin, who, he would have seen this happen from his country parsonage as he collected ever more British beetles, and it's kind of a rather limiting task, but he would have been becoming more and more obsessive, and he would have occasionally glimpsed the professional scientific literature, and he would have come across the name of Alfred Russell Wallace, who actually, and who, who knows who co the, the theory of evolution by natural selection was actually not Darwin's. It's Darwin and Wallace's. It was co-published a year before uh, The Origin of Species came out. It was Darwin and Wallace. Wallace was a nobody. Darwin was well-connected. He was a privileged person. Dar Wallace, however, was dirt poor. He made a living collecting organisms. And uh, man, his... We all think Darwin's is kind of romantic. Again, we've got the young man with the big sideburns on the, on the prow of the, uh, of the bee. We have this sort of romantic vision of him. He's a bore relative to um, Wallace. Wallace was poor, permanently struggling. He went for four years, he's virtually uneducated, four years to Brazil to collect specimens because he's passionately interested in natural history. What happened on the way home? Everything. 30-odd living specimens that he's brought down from the upper reaches of the Amazon River all the way across South America. These are with him. And this is what's going to make his name when he gets to London. Just imagine walking in, 18, in the 1830s, 1840s, into a scientific salon in London with a toucan on your forearm. A living toucan. Okay? Pretty cool. Okay? He's going to make, he's got all this fantastic four years of work. Knock on the door. It's the captain. I love this part of the story. The captain knocks on the door and says, Mr. Wallace, he's the only passenger on this ship, says, the boat's on fire. <laughs> Would you come and have a look? Which was the first mistake because they opened the hatch and just let air in, Sonny. <laughs> This was a, this was a uh, boat which had spent too long in the tropics. It went up like a tinder box. Um, so Wallace, this is truly poignant, movie makers, this is a great moment in <laughs> history of science. Wallace is in a lifeboat circling the burning wreck in the hope that rescue is going to come, okay? Watching the 30-odd, he's, he's already lost all his specimens, many of which were in alcohol, of course. <laughs> it's always a satisfying addition to a fire, an incendiary device. Um, um, but he's watching the animals that he's, his pets, and which were his pets, and they were going to make his name, freed by the fire, going out to the bowsprit, which is the only bit of the boat that's not on fire. Terrestrial animals, even birds, don't like the sight of infinite ocean, threw themselves back into the fire. That's the Wallace, of, 10 days after that, by the way, in an open boat. Great statement. This is, remember, he is English, stiff upper lip. He said, 
What, this is three days into, you know, they're dehydrating, nobody's going to rescue them. Ten days in an own boat in the middle of the Atlantic. He says, well, I saw some really nice shooting stars last night. And <laughs> <laughs> ah, come to think of it, couldn't be in a better place than on my back in a small open boat in the middle of the Atlantic for observing such things. That's, that's putting a positive spin on things. Um, anyway, gets back to England, he's got nothing. Right, he's lost everything. He writes a book, and Darwin, dear Darwin, says, a bit short on facts. He's lost all his journals, all his notes, okay? So he has to do it again. Eight years, extraordinary journeys through Southeast Asia. And during these journeys, he's slowly emerging from being a strict sort of naturalist collecting things. He's getting a synthetic picture. And he's thinking about what was called the species question. Where did biological diversity come from? And he published a paper in 1855, which was part of the theory, namely a genealogical process, what Darwin would call descent with modification. Then in 1858, in probably a malarial fit, that's the joy of malaria, he glimpsed a mechanism, natural selection. And then he did a truly weird thing. He was very disappointed by the reception to the earlier paper. He's trying to make it. He's a nobody, remember. Nothing had happened. He'd sent it off, and he was expecting irate letters to the journals and so on. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So he sent his new paper to the one person in scientific England he thought would be interested, Charles Darwin. It was the luckiest thing that ever happened to Charles Darwin, because otherwise he would have woken up three months later and been scooped. What happened as a result was Darwin and his high-placed cronies in British science contrived the, this joint publication, all done behind Wallace's back. But anyway, this is all, which is assuming that Darwin knew something about anything. In the absence of Darwin, Darwinism would be called Wallaceism. <laughs> and the stories would be so much better because he was so much cooler. <laughs> so, so Darwin's sort of like the Paris Hilton of his time, like spoiled rich kid, Gets everything he wants. Ghost books, ghost written, and a party animal, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was at, at Cambridge as an undergraduate. If you were throwing a party, you wanted Charles Darwin there. <laughs> yeah, just as you want Paris Hilton. I mean, same, same deal. Actually. Well, we don't want Paris Hilton. Yeah, we, uh, <laughs> we you don't. Probably get her to come out. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's forever pestering you guys, right? Yeah. <laughs> we changed. Yeah, I, I switched phones with him just to play. Yeah. It's the life of a comedian, guys. Yeah. Um, so Wallaceism would be the new, uh, how, how is, is Wallaceism any different from Darwinism? Uh, yes, it turns out that it is. In many respects, the formal structure of the theory is absolutely the same. But in one absolutely key area, um, these guys parted company. And that area is, it's the, it's the biggie. It's human evolution. Wallace was strict Darwinian, he in fact once described himself as more Darwinian than Darwin, whatever that means, um, um, except when it came to human evolution. And that was for two.